I feel very blessed of being today with you in this very auspicious meeting. Your Grace, thank you for the introduction, your very kind introduction, and your very scholarly introduction. I thought sometimes that you have read some of my notes. <laughs> Here, it's a coincidence of thinking and expression. Your Eminence, Reverend Fathers, a Doctor, I was glad to hear part of your presentation here. Uh, beloved brothers and sisters, I would add esteemed scholars. It's, this is a meeting with quite a number of high-level scholars, especially in the fields of psychology, uh, counseling, child education, etc. Parents, grandparents, it's a joy to have a participant who is just two months old. It's a good baby. It's, I mean, that should not pass unnoticed. It's, it's important. I would like first, before I do anything with my text here, uh, first to convey to all of you the warmest greetings from his All Holiness, our ecumenical patriarch. Uh, our ecumenical patriarch has a very, very strong feeling and connection with family and family affairs and children, being himself someone who uh, belongs to an extended family. That is important. That there are plenty of relatives, and therefore you have a strong feeling of family and also having a very particular and special love for children. So he blesses and wishes the best on this specific meeting here for success and fruitful two-day deliberations and scholarly work. I would like to allow me also to express my very strong and heartfelt Thanks to Father Constantine Sitaras, uh, who has been working on these family issues for years now. Let me share with you something before again I go to my text. I hope we have plenty of time. In the clergy lady congress in Philadelphia, in the year 2000, I had the honor to say that we have to develop a family center in the Archdiocese as a high priority, which should become a model family center functioning in <clears throat> many levels, level of counseling to fam families, work with family and children, anything that relates to family, from a theoretical level and study to a practical level of study. When we finished, some people said to me, the idea is very good, but this idea requires plenty of money and this money is not available. I said, thank you for the counter idea. But I said, well, this is something cannot wait. We don't depend on building a big building or creating a bureaucratic kind of situation. Here is Father Costa Sitaras and a small group in the beginning, and they start something at St. Basil's Academy. And step by step, year by year, we have uh, now a quite a developed uh, system in which we have a participation of real outstanding people. Presbyter Carey Papas is here with us, he's one of them. And the whole 
group around, and we have a conference like this one here uh, for a family ministry and how to create a Christocentric kind of family in the midst of a gradually, not simply secularized society, but something even worse than secularization. So I'm very thankful and I express my thanks for what is being done. And I pray that the work will continue. This is a characteristic meeting or symposium for which we are going to be very proud. We have, we have received something which belongs to the initiative of the Archdeacon Panteleimon. I don't know why he knew that I would include quite a part of my presentation from the letter to the Ephesians, and she, they did this kind of thing which I see for the first time. Uh, his, because they thought it would be a good thing for the people to, when there is a reference, to be able to see uh, the specific text. So it's, I'm thankful also for that. The, our second deacon, Father Eleftherios, who is with us, a graduate of Holy Cross, a son of a priest, a brother of a seminarian presently, and a member of a nine brothers and sisters family. So family is here at work. I greet you today with really profound joy, and I pray that uh, the uh, good Lord will be with us, as especially with you as you continue uh, working on uh, growing and rooting and grounding families in Christ and his church. This conference is both auspicious <clears throat> and timely. It is auspicious because it's a major demonstration of the vitality of our Archdiocesan Center for Family Care, and timely because the needs of the families in our nation today have never been more pressing than today. Allow me to extend one more expression of thanks to Father Conyaris for doing a tremendous publishing work for so many years and enriching the bibliography, the orthodox bibliography, at a time when uh, there were very few texts. Today, Father Conyaris, we have plenty. Sometimes you don't know what to choose. But when you started, that was not the case. Let me start with an introduction. I'm not going to proceed with a normal analysis of a biblical text. This, this will come, but I would like at the beginning, as an introduction, to say a few words about a very common topic. And I might then be sounding like a very trivially talking person, a modern crisis in family life. It was not so long ago, certainly within the memory of everyone present here, that the word family evoked a particular image in the minds of most Americans. In this mental picture, we saw a man and a woman, not just being together, but joined legally, and in most cases through a religious ceremony, in a lifelong bond of marital commitment. We saw children, usually more than one or two, who belong to both their parents by birth or adoption. For many of us, also, that family portrait included one or on more members of the previous generation a grandmother or a grandfather who lived in the home of their adult child rather than in a retirement community or nursing home. 
that was the picture. Today, there is a movement in our society to redraw this portrait completely. We hear mention of the modern family, quotation marks, and there is even a television show with this name. A show that depicts the American family of today as everything and anything except the traditional model that we once had held in common. It seems that any two people who share an address are to be considered a family. Whether or not they are married or have children together, in a recent poll, a majority of Americans said that if some people consider the same, the, themselves to be a family, they are a family. And so, the family is under pressure because its very sense of identity, of uniqueness, is being eroded by this huge change in public sentiment. If everybody and everything is a family, then nobody is truly a family in any meaningful sense. The family is under pressure in another way. The demands of the modern life weaken the bonds between family members, between parents and children, between siblings, between grandparents and grandchildren. Economic concerns take both parents out of the home and into the workplace for more and more hours each week. Employment opportunities move young couples to distant cities far from even close relatives. Failing birth rates mean that children, that's an interesting point, no longer easily find playmates in their own neighborhood so that Organized sports and activities away from home are becoming the norm. Children's athletic, athletics are becoming a focal point of suburban social life, even as daily practices and long road trips take children out of their homes for more and more hours each week. The net result of that family members is that family members spend more time with co-workers, teammates, paid caregivers than with each other. The real work of parenting, which is to say of developing character and life skills in children, falls in coaches and teachers. The real joys of companionship I would add also babysitters. The real joys of companionship are found in relationships outside of the home. Family life becomes a perfunctory routine rather than a fellowship of shared purposes. The family unit suffers a thousand cuts from societal obligations and expectations. So the modern world finds itself asking out only what is a family, but even why is a family? Why should we care about the welfare, the stability, the ephstathia, to use a Greek word, the well standing, of a particular group of people over against any other group or group forming? To this question, our holy orthodox Christian tradition gives an answer with clarion voice. The family is a divine institution, a special creation of God, one that bears his own holy name and dignity. St. Paul articulates this thought precisely addressing the Christians in Ephesus. Here is the text that you have in front of you. He says in Ephesians 3, 14, 19, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, 
he may grant you to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God is an amazing ending at the very conclusion of this long passage. As we open this wonderful time of discussion through the Family Ministry Conference, let us consider the great weight of meaning that these texts convey to us. For in understanding St. Paul's counsel to the Christians of Ephesus, we will better understand our own circumstances today. So now, after this introduction, my first part will deal with it. The fatherhood of God in Ephesians. The social context, an open door, but many adversaries. Ancient Ephesus was a coastal city of the Aegean Sea on the eastern part, as you know, of Asia Minor. It was a wealthy city, a significant center of commerce. In the first century BC, Ephesus had some quarter of a million residents, making it one of the largest cities of the Roman world. It was a thriving cosmopolitan place and society, much like ours today in America. Ephesus also was home to one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Remember the seven wonders, the pyramids of Egypt, the pharaohs in Alexandria, the hanging gardens in Babylon, the sarcophagus in Asia Minor, the uh, gold and ivory statue of Zeus in Olympia, the Colossus of Rhodes, and the temple of Artemis in Ephesus. This temple was one of the seven wonders, and it's a, it was four times the size of Parthenon, and had columns 60 feet high. It was a huge, imposing kind of building. We know from the Book of Acts now, it's not any other source, so more important, that the Ephesians believed that the statue of goddess, of goddess Artemis in this temple was heaven made and fall from the sky at some point. It was a heavenly kind of item. Artemis was worshiped as the goddess of the moon, a virgin, a hunter, a giver of light, and a patroness of fertility and childbirth. The Latin name of Artemis is Diana, Diana in the American usage of the language. The people of ancient Ephesus and its whole province of Asia Minor felt that they had a special bond with this goddess. She was to them, above all, a mother figure, and Artemis of Ephesians was regularly depicted in a st statue with many breasts, indicating her role as the nourisher and guardian of the city, feeding more than one or two children. For its part, the city named himself, herself a neochoros of the goddess, which is the keeper of her temple, thereby imposing a sacred duty on all residents to honor and protect their deity as they would do their own mother. It was for this reason that St. Paul's preaching evoked not merely 
opposition, but a riot throughout the city. The Ephesians honored Artemis as a divine mother from time immemorial, but they also had acquired a divine father as well. This was the, the emperor of Rome, which had at some point of history acquired divine status. So we have the worship of the emperor. So the emperor the, the, was the emperor of Rome. Artemis worship and emperor worship were quite literally two sides of the same coin. Uh, archaeologists have found coins minted in Ephesus from the reign of Emperor Claudius in the middle of first century, which have the figure of Artemis on the one side, the figure of the emperor on the other side. And these, these were the official coins of Ephesus. By this end of the first century, the temple of Artemis would also house the Augusteum, the official shrine of emperor worship, and the city would be honored a second time with the title Neocoros, this time for the emperors, the guardian of the emperor's worship. One of the titles given to honor Roman emperors was the Latin phrase pater patriae, father of the nation. The Ephesians were therefore claimed not only by divine mother, but also by a divine father in the person of the emperor. The Ephesian family, it seems, had been defined by fully developed pagan worship of Artemis as an emperor, as members, mother and father of the Ephesian community. When the apostle Paul came to Ephesus with his gospel of one God, the heavenly father, who sent his only begotten son for the world's salvation, he was challenging the Ephesians and their ideas in a very radical way. He would redefine their idea of family. Some would embrace the gospel preached by Paul as the good news of true divine love. Some would reject it bitterly. St. Paul knew this, and for this reason, he wrote to the church uh, of Corinth, that in Ephesus there awaited him a wide open door for effective ministry, but also many adversaries. So here we come at the second part here, the Christian theology of fatherhood and family. When St. Paul was in prison in Rome, he wrote this letter to the Ephesians. In his six short chapters of this very important letter, he covers the basic themes of what Christians believe and how they are to live as children of God. In his letter, St. Paul refers to God as Father a total of eight times. Eight times reference to God as Father in six small chapters chapters, which is more than the total of the chapters in 1st, 2nd Corinthians and Romans, the, the Ephesian letter is, has more than the three major letters together, which shows the centrality of this idea of the fatherhood of God in the letter to the Ephesian. At the heart of the epistle of his this revolutionary statement that we have got already, we have the phrase, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. Please, in your text, pay attention to the Greek text because in the Greek text there is a word play. The name of, for family in the Greek text is patria. So look how it sounds in the Greek. Tutu harin kam to tagona tamu. Now, this is the point. Proston patera, to the father. Exu pasa patria, from whom every family. Patir, patria. 
the name of the family is related to God the Father, is named on, in heaven and on earth. St. Paul chooses his words more carefully. He says that the one true God who reveals himself as the Father, Pater, is the one whom every family patria is named. What Paul is saying here is that you cannot have a family, any family, without this unique Father who is God. The centrality of God the Father for any family. This is a very clear repudiation of any other would-be parent that might claim to the affection of the Ephesians, either as a divine mother, Artemis, or as a divine father, the emperor. St. Paul says that God the Father and only he give his name to every family, both those in heaven and on earth. We see even more clearly that Paul displaces both Artemis and the emperor in his expression, I bow my knees. Why? St. Paul was a Jew, and Jews customarily would stand in prayer, not kneel. Kneeling was the posture of, mostly, of Gentile worship. Kneeling would have been the posture of Artemis worship, and also the posture of and Artemis and emperor worship. Paul teaches the Ephesians, the Ephesians that kneeling is to be reserved only to God. I am kneeling in front of God, not the emperor or Artemis or anyone. So it's a very important kind of turning, this whole issue of kneeling in front of the emperor's shrine or Artemis and saying, no, only God deserves this genuflection, which he clearly states in his letter here. This is a father, unlike the emperor, unlike the idea of the Roman pater familias. These Roman fathers exercise authority over their, their household as masters, lording it over servants. And here I'm referring to what His Grace mentioned before, because the Latin word familia comes from the word famulus, means servant, means servant. Which means the family is to be understood as an entity of servants, close to the idea of slave, not to the idea of serving. That's the meaning here. So then, uh, St. Paul, revolutionary theology family, says God is the father who gives service to his household, sparing them nothing that he has to offer, not even his only begotten son. Even at the end of the passage here, speaks about filling them with the, his fullness of God. It's an amazing reversal of any idea of recognizing goddess and goddesses, gods and goddesses as the person worth of worship. And in the concept of family, if the concept of family then derives from a father in heaven such as this, it is truly a holy thing indeed. Such a sublime word is not to be used lightly, the word family. It has a divine origin, and it has to be contrasted with all other things that are involved clearly in the Ephesian situation. And so here we are, very simply, listening to Paul who says, the family is an institution of divine origin and character, not merely a social arrangement that arises from the exigencies of earthly affairs, the family is a microcosmic expression of the God's fatherly care for the whole universe. This care is expressed by God's condescending in binding himself in an unbreakable covenant of love towards all, a covenant drawn up by the blood of his incarnate son. This, our heavenly father, 
accomplished for us, St. Paul, through the sacrifice of his only son and according to the riches of his glory, that, that he may grant all of us strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. And the passage follows with tremendous kind of revelation of the depth and height and width of the love of God and the need to understand that and finally be filled with the fullness of God. To such a father, Paul prays kneeling in a kneeling position and offers the absolute and ultimate worship. Now let me proceed a bit more. In presenting family life as an icon of the divine prototype, St. Paul is following the teaching of the scripture, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament we would see this idea that Paul presents in a very condescend form in the Ephesian letter. The family, the family's beginning is described in the book of Genesis, the first book of the Old Testament. As we know, according to Genesis, God through his creative action forms the first man, then fashions the woman, to be complementary to him as equals who balance and fulfill each other as one flesh. God gives them a home and meaningful work in the Garden of Eden. Look, the family is at the beginning of the creation of humanity there. He grants them the godlike power of procreation so that together they may enjoy children who are formed in their own image. In love and harmony, the family finds joy, each member is, loves each other, and each member serves each other. It is this joy that is pronounced blessed and happy in Psalm 127, the psalm that we chant in the sacrament of marriage. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be happy and it shall be well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive trees around your table. Lo, thus shall be the man be blessed who fears the Lord. It's a beautiful picture of family bliss. Some will say that this is a naive portrait of the family. Is it? Do not the scripture also show that the family can be the arena of terrible crimes? Don't forget, the first murder was a murder in the first family. Cain killed Abel. That was family. So then, here we have, you know, to go to the conspiracy of Jacob and his mother, Rebecca, against his brother, Esau, within a family, and the selling of Joseph by his brother to the merchants, to Egypt, not to point to horrific infidelities Lot, Judah, David, Ammon, etc. And these are valid points, ones that serve rather to corroborate the thesis that the family is a divine institution for that which has the greatest potential for good has also the potential for evil. The sacred trust that binds a family together can become an occasion for tremendous evil when that trust is abused by parent or child or sibling. But the good potentialities of families, of family life are so great that even in a condition of brokenness, the prophets of Israel saw an icon of divine love 
in the family. Many times they speak of God's relationship to his people Israel as that of a loving husband towards a wayward wife who neither overlooks her sin nor forsakes her utterly, but calls always for her to be restored to him and reconciled. Full knowledge of the negative potential, but sanctity and divine origin and the tremendous potential always for correction and restoring. St. Paul appropriates the very uh, image in his letter to the Ephesians in speaking in chapter five of the ch Christ and the church. And he says exactly that the bond of husband and wife is analogous to the bond of Christ to the church. It's one of the terrific passages in the scripture. This is among the strongest texts in scripture affirming the deeply existential nature of the family as a union between a husband and wife. Another apostle, St. John the Evangelist, who spent time also in ministry according to the old church tradition, he would have told the Ephesians the stories of Christ's love for the family. Would they not have rejoiced to hear that Christ's first miracle was the transformation of water into wine just in order to support and strengthen the celebration of a new marriage? To this day, we commemorate the event in our beautiful Orthodox service of matrimony because this is the reading from the New Testament that we use in the service of marriage. St. John would also have the Ephesians of Christ's words from the cross, words that healed a terrible wound in the family, giving his disciple John a son to his holy mother and giving the Theotokos as mother to John. It is a moment of breathtaking beauty that Jesus, in such agony, barely able to speak or even breathe, yet through utmost effort, pronouncing the blessing of a renewed family in which his mother and his beloved disciple is involved. What efforts are we willing to make? And allow me one more thing, which is also very important. Have we contemplated the fact that the incarnate Son of God spent 30 years in a family? He didn't went to the desert as John the Baptist. He stayed for 30 years in a very average family of an insignificant place in Palestine. He didn't go to any university city he stayed as a carpenter in a family. Remember the event when Christ was 12 years old and he remained in the temple when the parents, and when they returned, Panagia said, why you did that? Don't you know that your father and myself, we were looking for you? And he said, don't you know that I have to be in the house of my father? But the language is father, mother, is family. It's a full family. And that's one of the strongest points for the value and the superb, really, uh, significance of the family. Now, what efforts are we willing to make to bring renewal and blessedness, wholeness and security, stability and prosperity to our Christian families? We do not hang by nails on a cross. We live in the lap of luxury and comfort. Can we not find the strength, the will, the energy to offer a blessing to those who, whom we love as did Christ? And I was so glad to hear in the previous session the talk about parents and children and the affection, the affect 
the tenderness, the gesture by Christ, taking the children and embrace them and blessing them. Can we just think of that kind of picture? We do not live in Ephesus, of course. But there is an Artemis, even today. Just as she was the goddess of the moon, the one, according to the pagan Ephesians, the one who shines light in the darkness, we have the unearthly light that fascinates us and our children, a light that pulls families apart, each member in a separate room of the home, a light that really fascinates and enervates. I speak of the light of all screens in our lives, television screens, computer screens, iPads, iPods, tablets, smartphones, and the whole company of luminous screens acting like goddess Artemis, just capturing the attention. Well, we have developed a modern culture of the face in a box at all times of day and night. They are inescapable in waiting rooms, restaurants, stores, stadiums. We no longer look into the faces of one another. We stare at the screen, mesmerized and transfixed. In a, the ancient world, it was silversmiths who fashioned the image of Artemis. Today, the silver screen fashions for every imagination of the human mind from the sublime to the subversive and increasingly to the ridiculous. So then, at this new polymastic goddess, as this goddess enchants us and addicts us to the destruction of our family, we have to have an answer. We do not live in Ephesus, but we also have our own emperor's cult today. Don't think that I would go to mention political persons. Our lives are ruled by a new tyrant, the tyrant of the urgent, the busy, to borrow the phrase of Charles Hamel. Our families are on a treadmill of activities and obligations driven by scholastic work, team sports, workplace demands, and social expectations. The pressure is to say yes to everything, to refuse an opportunity for more, not to refuse an opportunity for more money, more entertainment, more playing time. We have forgotten how to separate needs from wants the important from the optional and the secondary. How many of our families find their Sunday mornings dominated by an activity other than, other than liturgy and Sunday school and togetherness in the community? How many of our families fill the summer with every activity except worship? I always remember when I first came to America in 1964. And in the summer of 65, I was asked about uh, worship in the church. They said, no, there is no liturgy. I said, why? Because our priest has a one month vacation and at that time we closed the church. I said, are you serious? Did you close the church for a month? He said, yeah. So they look at me in full surprise that I was surprised. <laughs> I said, well, <laughs> obviously, that's something. But that sometimes is not just a one or two Sundays. But it's my, much more. How many of our families cannot find an hour each day
to sit down around the table together and share God's bounties in a meal. The emperor of Rome demanded just a pinch of incense offered to his divine genius from time to time. Our tyrant of constant business and urgency demands every waking hour to be filled with activities that drive apart parents and children, husband and wife, generation from generation within the American family. You pardon my excessive language. It's just emphatic. I'm just underlining very simple sentences. So the substance is just there, even without any emphasis. My beloved people, I call upon you and all of us in this truly timely conference, which really constitutes an answer and a strong medication to the diseases that are plaguing our community and have a destructive effect on the family. And then here we are to consider seriously a return to a rediscovery of the tremendous and parallel value of the family as a godly institution and restore the image, the supreme image of God, the Father of all, that blesses fathers and mothers and children in the families. When St. Paul spoke of bowing his knees to the Heavenly Father from whom every family is named, he spoke words of earth-shaking significance, words of revolutionary import. We need a revolution in our family life. We need to fire a shot to be heard around the world, calling our fathers and mothers, our sons and daughters, our brothers and sisters, to come together once again and put aside the shackles of business and screen addition among other things, I did mention some other terrible realities that plague us. It's time to remake the home as a catechon ecclesia, a church at home. When God the Father ch chose to bring his son into the world, he did so in a remarkable way. He arranged for Christ to be born into a family. We can imagine how it might have been otherwise. Mary might have been a single mother, never married, never even engaged. But in God's wisdom, his son from all eternity entered our human life in a family. And in this family, he lived, as I said, for 30 years and played and worked and grew, to use the text from St. Luke, in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and the people. If this is how the Christ himself was raised, why should we want anything less than that for our children? for our fullness of the family and the experience of our family in its relationship to God. St. Paul started his admonition to the Ephesians with the declaration of the divine origin of the family. He ended by proclaiming that the final purpose of the family is that her members whom do, should know the love of Christ that surpasses every knowledge and that they may be filled with all the fullness of God. 
This is our sacred task, to strengthen and confirm this sacred and God-named institution, the family. May the Lord strengthen you who so diligently work for the enhancement of this beautiful institution, the internal and universal institution of family. May the Lord grant you love and strength to accomplish in its fullness such a task so that each of you and of all of us and the members of our families be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen.